Jim Morrison, thank you so much for coming in today. I'm excited to talk about your career here at Gilman and just anything that comes up in the conversation. But we were just talking about Oppenheimer and you're reading this book that sounds fascinating. I'd love to know just a little bit more about the Manhattan Project and how it really came together and kind of who Oppenheimer was and what this book that you're reading is like. Yeah, so um, Oppenheimer was this wealthy Jewish guy from the Upper East Side in Manhattan. Um, and he was recognized as being really quite brilliant, even from an early age. Um, and he, he became a physicist, um, he and his brother, actually. Um, and he um, really was never in good health, but he would go on these, like, really epic horseback rides and things like that. Um, they would go out west. Um, he, he became in love with the desert in the, in the, out in the west, and ultimately he bought uh, a hunk of land out there. Um, so when, it, when they were developing, he, when he became in charge of the scientists who were developing the atomic bomb, um, they chose this site out there in New Mexico because it was out in the middle of nowhere and they needed to keep this private and secret because they were worried about um, the Germans finding out any information that they had because we were in competition with the Germans, the Nazis developing this bomb. So these early, these scientists that were involved in the Manhattan Project, um, interestingly, had a very kind of leftist um, tilt to them, um, which I think a lot of scientists do. Um, but they really wanted to, they were helping them, they were really working for the military to, to develop this bomb. The military wanted it because they were afraid that the Germans would get it first. Mm -hmm. um, so these scientists, including Oppenheimer, you know, gave their all to this project. Um, and it was a race against time. Um, and actually, by the time they developed the bomb, the Germans were already defeated. Mm. So they did it in three years. Um, the Los Alamos site grew from nothing. There was actually a small little college out there that they started, they used their facilities, and it just grew into this um, community of, you know, a couple of thousand people, um, all under uh, military control. And Oppenheimer and uh, the military kind of were um, jointly doing this together. Um, and early in his life, Oppenheimer, or earlier in his life, Oppenheimer um, had associations with um, communism. So later, this com comes to be a serious issue um, when the House on American Committee um, starts, you know, McCarthyism starts, they start to really go after Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. um, but during the development of the bomb, you know, he, at that point, he becomes like a hero because he delivers. In three years, they produce the bomb. Um, it's tested in um, at this site that he calls the Trinity site. Um, and if you've ever watched footage from that, it's, it's pretty astounding. It's astounding. Yeah. So they've done all these calculations about how much energy is going to be released. You know, Einstein's equation e equals mc squared basically says that matter can be converted into energy. Mm -hmm. And according to that equation, a little teeny bit of matter is going to create this incredible amount of energy. Um, and interestingly, they were like really not sure what exactly is going to happen here. Um, one set of calculations thought that maybe we could, you know, explode the entire planet. Like really? the whole atmosphere would blow up. But they had misplaced a decimal point, and then they decided, well, no, that's impossible. We're not going to be able to blow up the whole planet. So, so they had this equation in yeah. mind about what could happen if they split the atom, right? If, yes. That, that's what's actually going on. Yeah, you're splitting an atom, right. But what was it like to actually practice that? Like, how did they go about the first trial of doing this? I mean, I know the desert is the perfect place to do that, but still, if you if you don't know what's going to happen, that's... It's terrifying. Well, they do a lot of they do a lot of calculations. The book doesn't go into a lot of the actual physics of it, but the physics of it is, as you say, what's happening in a, in an atomic bomb is you're splitting an atom. You, you start with heavy atoms. So the first thing they had to do was get um, 
enough mass, like what's called a critical mass of heavy atoms of plutonium um, that are fissionable, splittable. You have to have a critical mass of them. So to, to get those isotopes, to get enough of them together, um, was, you know, and, uh, took some doing in and of itself. And then what they have to do is design a bomb that takes two um, subcritical masses of this isotope and ram it together. You reach critical mass. And then what happens is when one atom splits, it gives off little particles, neutrons, that then split other atoms, which then split other atoms. And you have um, a reaction that is going to grow exponentially. And every time an atom is split, energy is given off. 80 gazillion of these things happen in a split second, and then you have that huge explosion. Um, so they did their calculations, and they, you know, they've got the critical amount of material that they need, and they designed this bomb, which was they called it Big Boy. It was like a gargantuan sphere with all these conventional explosives around the outside of it, so that you could smash the two critical masses together. Mm. So what they did at the Trinity test is they, um, they built a tower and they lifted the bomb to the top of this tower, um, I don't know, like 100 feet up in the air because Oppenheimer knew that we, with this bomb we wanted to you know, create as much destruction as possible. So if the bomb is closer to the ground, most of that energy is going to go into the ground. It's going to create a big, like a big crater. So to mimic what it's going to be like when we drop this bomb, they brought, bring it up to the top of this big tower. They're 20 miles away. They have an electronic um, device to set the thing off. Hmm. So when they press that button the first time, no one really knows exactly what's going to happen. They've done their calculations, but there was quite a range in how much energy is going to be released. How, how far away were they when they... 20 miles. 20 miles. Yeah. So at 20 miles away this thing goes off it's when it first goes off it's so hot it's hotter than the sun the surface of the sun and um the people watching this from 20 miles away um just see a big flash of light they don't hear anything because sound travels much slower than light um, and they don't feel anything this big flash of light happens um and then this big blast of you know, sand and a shock wave goes, you know, they can feel it in their chest. Um, so it was quite an explosion. So it m met all expectations. Mm. So it was like, yeah, they were, they were so happy. We accomplished this incredible task. Um, but it's interesting, like immediately afterwards, like people reacted to the explosion in, in, in a variety of ways. Some people, there was this feeling of euphoria. We've been working on this project. It, we, we brought it to fruition. Um, we can deliver the bomb to the military like we were, were, we were supposed to do. But on the other hand, the explosion was so enormous and so destructive that people, these scientists, many of them immediately kind of had this opposite feeling like, oh my God, what have we created? Yeah. What have we unleashed on the world? Mm. Um, and most of this Oppenheimer book, I think really ultimately um, revolves around that kind of theme. Um, you know, Oppenheimer was a humanist, um, which is why he kind of had these communist leanings earlier in his life you know that like socialism we're all in this together all for one one for all mm -hmm. um you know share resources um so once this bomb is unleashed they immediately their thoughts go to wow like how is this going to be used um because at this point, we had already run the war against Germany. Germany had already surrendered, which was the main reason we were developing the bomb, mm -hmm. to beat the Germans. But we still had the Japanese. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the Russians were on our side, right? We were in the war, they were you know, in the war with us fighting the Nazis, but now the Nazis are defeated and immediately the military attention is like, oh, the Russians, they're not, they're gonna be our competition. Yeah, right. That, that, that was always bizarre to me, like seeing pictures of Roosevelt with Stalin and Churchill, like these, you know, two leaders who you figure 
you know, Churchill and Roosevelt, who would, yeah, they, they make sense to be together. But then Stalin, who is, you know, one of the most evil dictators in the world, right. they kind of needed each other to defeat the Nazis. And then once that happened, the, right. know, the, the relations switched completely. Oh, yeah. We were always really um, uh, cautious about the Russians. We always, you know, did not trust them. Ultimately, we just kind of used them, right, to keep the Nazis in check and fight that Eastern Front. Um, mm-hmm. But once the Nazis were, were done, we didn't really need them anymore. Um, so then the book goes into, okay, so now we're gonna, what are we gonna do with this bomb? We've got this bomb and you get the sense that the military really needed to show the world or America needed to show the world that we had this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we drop it on Japan and I had always thought, you know, in my school days, you know, the kind of narrative I was told was that, you know, we needed to do that because um, we would have lost so many of our men fighting the Japanese to take, you know, it's an archipelago fighting for each island because they fought, you know, tooth and nail to the very inch of land. But after reading this book, um, the, the Japanese were already were defeated even though they hadn't surrendered yet. They were really defeated. And a lot of people thought that we don't need to drop the bomb on them. They are ready to, you know, surrender, give up. Was Nag- Do you know if Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Hiroshima were, were they military-based places or were they mostly no. civilians? So we're dropping this bomb not on a military target. We're dropping this bomb on a civilian city. And most of the people killed in Hiroshima... 100,000 people killed outright were, you know, women and children. Mm -hmm. The men were already, like, off to war and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and and to this day, of course, America's the only country that's ever dropped a bomb, the the bomb, on people. Yeah. Um, So it kind of puts us in a negative light. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, when my generation always brought up, like, America, you know, we're the best... Mm-hmm. And, and in a way, we are, right? We did develop this thing. We have incredible science ability and technological um, capabilities. Um, but you start to really question some of the decisions that were made, mm-hmm. like to drop that bomb or, you know, at all, like, and then to do it again on Nagasaki a few days later. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I actually have Truman's biography from the library checked out and it's massive it's david mccullough wrote it and yeah it's, i want to read that too. it's like 800 900 pages it's really thick but i've been trying for a while now it's just sitting in my on my bookshelf at this point but i've been trying to find the part where it's truman's decision to say yes we're gonna drop this bomb because that's always fascinated me that i feel like that doesn't get talked about much like the process that he he had with the um, what is the project called? The Atomic Bomb? Manhattan Project. Manhattan Project and actually going forth and dropping this bomb on Japan. I don't really hear about that too much. And I think an, an interesting question is, like, if you could be a fly on the wall at any historical moment, what would you, where would you want to listen in on? And I think that decision and the conversations around dropping the bomb and Truman would be my choice. Well, you can imagine who was in the room with him advising him. The military then was really militaristic. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. At least they come across that way in this book. Um, that, you know, we got this bomb. We have to show the Russians that we have this bomb. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, after we've done that, what happens next is really interesting too, because what starts soon there, there after that is. The military is really pushing for the next kind of bomb. For first of all, we start making, you know, Oppenheimer argues we've got this bomb. Um, the Russians will soon have the bomb, which they did. It wasn't. It was pretty just a year or two later that they got the atomic bomb as well. Um, and then in our military was like, well, we need more of these bombs. And in very short order, we went from having like 40 atomic bombs to having thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, mm-hmm. with the, you know, the Russians basically doing the same thing. And Oppenheimer argued that these bombs can't be used for anything. 
you can't use these on a military target. There's no target that's big enough for this bomb. Right. The bomb is just so destructive. It'd blow everything up. Right. It's just going to annihilate humanity. But it was more the it was more the idea that this country has this amount of bombs and could do this much destruction. It was an arms race. Yeah, and you know the military was were at what's really horrified Oppenheimer. They were the military. Some of these military leaders were like planning like we are just going to annihilate. They had like forty different major Russian cities that we're just going to annihilate, mm-hmm. like basically wipe them off the map. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like wow. Um, so, of course, we obviously we never did do that, but. Um, so they then they want the next bomb, and the next bomb is a fusion bomb, the hydrogen bomb, mm-hmm. which will be thousands of times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Oh, really? Yeah, it's called it was called the super. Yeah. All right. Um, so, and that's kind of where I am in the book now. Um, that they the military is really pushing for this next bomb, and Oppenheimer and. A whole committee, the Atomic Energy Committee that he is on, is really pushing back against that. Um, and that is when he really starts, his enemies start to kind of attack him um, during this kind of McCarthyism, um, you know, House of Un American activities mm-hmm. um, thing. And most of it's based on stuff that he did, had done 20 years earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, but they really are trying to undermine him. I mean, after we drop the atomic bomb or after the bomb is developed, Oppenheimer is like on the cover of Time magazine. He's, he's, an int- he's a national hero. Um, you know, he's like untouchable. Like he represents what America can do and the best of us. Um, and then in these years following that, um, when he really starts pushing back against the, you know, the development of all these bombs. And, and even back during the development of the bomb, he argued for sharing the information with the Russians, because supposedly they're our allies. Mm-hmm. We should share this information from the, with them so that they're not so suspicious of us, um, which, of course, that never happened. Does the book, do you feel like the book gives you a good sense of who Oppenheimer was as a person and kind of these interior ar- arguments that he's having with himself about the whole issue at hand? Yeah, I mean, it does. It really fleshes him out. I mean, it's a, it's a biography and it starts off from his early childhood and all the way through. So you do get a sense of him. Um, you know, he, he's a complicated character. He chain smokes. He smokes like four packs of cigarettes a day. So almost every picture of him, he's got a cigarette. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. wore this like little stove uh, pipe hat kind of thing. This like, a, you know, just like a misshapen hat he always has on his head. Um, hmm. He was a real character. He only weighed like 120 pounds. Um, yeah. Out at Los Alamos, they would go out on these horseback rides for days on end with barely any food. He would just... He had like unbelievable amounts of energy. This, and like, where did this energy come from? Um, he's just smoking. Oh God! He he loved martinis. He made these epic martinis. Um, and the women loved him. He had a lot of um, charisma with women. Um, a lot of riz, as the as the kids say these days. A lot of riz. That's the current. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm out of it on that. <laughs> he has a lot of riz. Yeah, a lot of riz. Yeah. Um, Interesting. I always find the psychology of these types of people, because I don't know too much about Oppenheimer. He's a figure that, yeah, you hear his name, but you don't really know. I haven't learned much about his life and who we, what he was like. Yeah, and I found that interesting, too, because the same was true for me. I mean, of course, I had heard his name before. I knew he was the head of the Manhattan Project, but I didn't realize, like, what a national hero he was at that point in time. Like, in the late 40s, you know, he was just huge. Was Einstein along for the, like, was he living in Alamos with Oppenheimer for these three years or? I don't know. Einstein was not at Los Alamos, I don't believe. Um, Another big physicist was Niels Bohr, who our chemistry students would know. He's the guy that came with the idea of energy levels, and he was a part of the whole really quantum theory uh, of physics, which is really where physics is at now. 
But after the war, um, Einstein is at Princeton. Um, He's there, a professor. He, there's, an insti- no, he's in a, there's an institute at Princeton that I had not known about. Um, I forgot its full name, but it's, a, it's like a scientific institute. It's separate from Princeton University. Um, and Oppenheimer becomes in charge of that institute as well. And Einstein and Oppenheimer are both there at this institute. Hmm. So I wonder why, um, did you pick up this book because of the movie that's coming out? Or No, where- I actually picked the book up before the movie, and then, but soon thereafter this, I start seeing you know, the coming attractions for this Is movie. it a new biography? Is it recently published? No, it's out in paperback, so it's been out for a number of years, oh. been out for a couple of years. I picked up the book because um, Alex DeWeese was reading it and um, put it on my radar. I'm like, yeah, I definitely have to read that. Mm-hmm. So I you know, just went on Amazon and got myself a copy. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, um, I, I think about that question a lot, and I guess it, it's difficult to compare these two techno- or, or technologies with each other, like something like the atomic bomb that is quite obviously today so destructive with some of the other things that are just coming out that have changed the world, like social media, for instance, and And Mark Zuckerberg and artificial intelligence. And the fact that these people in their mind as they're creating it have thoughts about how it might impact society, but they don't know to the full extent of how it's going to change the world until years later. Yeah, so I think that's really interesting too. I mean, the book really reverberates with me in terms of what's happening now, like with ChatGPT. Like, we don't really know what we unleash on the world when we kind of create these technological things that give humans an incredible amount of power. And with AI, who who are we giving this power to? Maybe to a machine. Mm-hmm. Not even other humans, um, and we don't. You, it, you know, you can't know how this is going to play out. Right. What are the repercussions of this? Right. Um, and usually, it's not anything good. And I'm here. I've been teaching science all this year. And I'm not going to argue that science isn't good, but you know, we always like get ourselves into these fixes, whether it's climate change or whatever it is, and like, oh, technology is going to it's going to save us. Yeah. And then we develop something else, and like. <laughs> it gives us even more problems. Right. You know, we have an invasive species. Well, we're gonna bring in, um, we're gonna bring in this thing that's gonna eat that thing, and then that thing takes over, and it's like, now that's a problem. Yeah, 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 and I think, you know, Facebook is a good example because Facebook was started out in a college dorm room and it was supposed to be kind of a dating app at at the school, and it's just blown up into this, I mean, I guess Facebook isn't, itself like the website is popular now but it's like instagram and these other social media sites that you know they dictate elections and they they sway how people think about the country and they divide they divide us in a lot of ways yeah i mean facebook was supposed to be the great social thing that's going to bring us together and you know you're going to be able to connect with people it's all positive 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 and then there's all these there's a huge negative side to it It affects elections um mental health it affects the stock market like you know when um one company's a bank starts to go down it, like the information spreads on social media in a in, at the speed of light and right. everyone's pulling their their money out of these banks and like the whole banking system collapses mm-hmm. And if you didn't have social media, none of that would have happened that fast. People have a moment to think about things. Right, right. It's so reactionary. So and so instant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, The artificial intelligence is interesting because I can see, you know, I think it's amazing. I was telling you that I'm that I'm making this toast at my sister's wedding. And I was just like, oh, let's see what the chat GPT says of like (laughs) certain ideas that I have. I think it's really amazing in terms of idea generation. But. I don't know. It's scary how good it is at crafting something for you. And I just wonder, you know, if, how it's going to change the way humans like create things. Like if you have this tool that's pretty much an assistant, you know, you you're not really using your own mind as much. You're just it's it's almost a lazy way of lazy and productive at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um well, it's like Mr. Hastings' um, assembly a little bit while back. Um, he brings that up. Like, 
what is it that is unique about being a human mm -hmm. that can't be mimicked by a machine or a machine can even do better than us you know like when the first computer could beat somebody at playing chess right that was like a big deal right 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 now they can beat us playing chess now they can beat us writing shakespeare <laughs> yeah or making music or art yeah art it, it, some of the ai generated art i mean knowing that it is generated by a computer makes it less impressive in my opinion, but still you look at it and you're like, wow, that's detailed. Right, and at this point, it's still like, if you're a real artist or an expert in your field, you're gonna be able to tell something that was AI generated as opposed to human generated, mm -hmm. but it's just getting better and better by leaps, like it's growing exponentially like everything with technology, right? So it's just gonna get better and better to the point where you're not gonna be able to, re even the experts are not gonna be able to tell what's a real photograph or what was generated by AI. Yeah. And I mean, that's one of the things that scares me the most. We were talking about social media and you combine this with social media and no one, people are not gonna know what's true and what's not true. They already have a hard time, you know, discerning this is real and this is not real. You know, we have this whole idea of alternative realities. Well, now you're gonna have many alternative realities that are gonna be incredibly real. Right, you're gonna watch a video of a politician that looks real, sounds real, spreads like wildfire across the internet, but is in fact created by a computer. Right, or you can put words in other people's mouths. Yeah. You can take a, a given politician like a Joe Biden and have him say things that he would never say. Right, right. And have it be very real. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think as teachers at the high school level, you know, what we really, what our job is to figure out what skills our students need as they go out into the world and go off to college days, the last day for seniors and right. Like thinking about what skills they'll need at the next stage in the professional world is very difficult with all of these disruptive technologies taking <laughs> off. Yeah, I mean, we, it's always, we've always said that, well, there's some basic things these kids will always need to be able to do. They're going to be able to read. They're going to be able to write. Mm -hmm. Well, do they? If, you know, AI can write for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, well, then what do you need these? What do you need people for? Mm -hmm. Like emails, especially like so many jobs require you to sit at a desk and write emails for a majority of the day. And if the computer can do that pretty well, right? It, yeah, I can't write a Shakespeare sonnet right. like Shakespeare could, or can't write, you know, a Tolstoy book, War and Peace, like Tolstoy could, but it can sure write an email for you. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, yeah. Or, you know, whole, whole professions like paralegals, you won't need them because, you know, AI can do, it, can do it just as well. You won't need people to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or even like, you can imagine even like tech help, you know, you call these lines and somebody's in India or whatever doing, <laughs> they'll just have AI do all that. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm doing a podcast on Friday morning with Luke Woodworth's dad, who's a surgeon. And I was thinking, it's, I need to figure out some good questions to ask him, but think about surgery and like the precision of a robot versus a human hand. I'm curious about how artificial intelligence could disrupt medicine. You know, like, would you rather a person do surgery on you or something that's, you know, didn't have too much coffee in the morning? Right, right. right. Doesn't have a hangover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or even telehealth, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you just talk to the computer about your problem and it takes in all the information and has all the data to process that and gives you a, an answer what you should do, what you should take or. Right, right. It's disruptive to relationships too because I see why people would maybe rather or, or could easily form a relationship with something that talks back to you and understands you and gathers information about you and continuously pieces together information about your life that can almost mimic a, a good friend. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that um, in, like along the lines of telehealth, um, you know, for mental health, people feel very comfortable talking to the AI machine or whatever um, mm. and, and as you say, can develop a relationship with that and yeah, it's a, it's a crazy new world. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
the science building is one building that I don't spend too much time in. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that I wanted to, I guess, talk to you about today um, is kind of what goes on in there. Like what is, <laughs> what's it like in that building? I mean, I've been in there when I first came to Gilman and was walking around and probably gone in there two or three times since, but I'd like to know what it's like working in the science department at Gilman. You've had a lot of experience doing that and you know, you're about to leave Gilman. So yeah, it's been my home for 40 years. Um, yeah, it's a little bigger than it was when I first came here. They added that extension on in, in the year 2000, and they got a got a fluff renovation a, a few years ago. weren't there weren't there trailers and outdoor classrooms at some point? Like didn't? When, oh yeah, when well when Gilman the, when Carry Hall was being renovated, okay. we had what was called the Hound Pound. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that was before your time. Um, so um, back where those back fields are, right before the parking lot, that's where tennis courts were, but they were like 30 feet lower down. Oh. Like, that was all landfilled in. They buried those tennis courts. But on the tennis courts is where the hound pound was. So they had these temporary um, buildings that the whole upper school basically was using for the, for the year and a half that Carry Hall was getting renovated. Um, but we still had the science building. Um, so we were kind of not as affected by all that mm -hmm. as everybody else. Um, they, when they renovated our building in 2000, when they added that wing on the back of the building, we were out of the building for the summer and then like the fall until like October. And we just had our classes in Cary Hall. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't really do labs or anything for that fall season. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what's it like in the building? Um, you know, it's got classrooms, it's got labs, mm -hmm. probably has its own little smell from <laughs> dissections or from the chemicals in the chemical lab. A lot of people say, it has a smell in here, but I don't smell it anymore. Um, we're a very tight um, department. It's, yeah. it's always been that way, even when I f first came here, even to, the, there's been a lot of turnover over the years, of course, but it's, very tight department. Mm -hmm. um, and when the pandemic came, it really, uh, in a way, kind of made us even more kind of siloed in our own building. Cause you know, we, you couldn't eat in carry hall. So we would all just like oh, yeah. pick up our lunches and scurry to offices and everything. But since we have our own building, we would eat in our conference room. You know, what's crazy is last year, not at this time, but maybe a couple months before right now, we were still wearing masks. I know, right? Isn't that wild? And it all feels like so long ago already. It does. It it's, does. It's incredible. Although I feel like, you know, we talk about this a lot too, though. I think the students, there's something, there's a residual effect that it had on our students. You think so? Oh, yeah. Can you tell? Yeah. In terms of like study skills and what I call playing school, um, they seem to have, some students have just lost a lot. Like they don't know how to like take notes or organize materials or you know s keep themselves engaged mm -hmm. in a constructive way um you know it's a minority of kids but there's definitely a significant minority of students that are still struggling with those issues i think maybe uh maturity as well like i've just noticed some of my senior students at least uh, they're not they don't really act like I would imagine seniors in high school. would. I, I don't remember what I was like as a senior in high school, but I don't know. Some of them seem much younger than they are. Yeah, I think that's really true. And that's because probably because they were in their basements for a year and a half and weren't talking to people and weren't interacting with teachers. And they're missing, I think they're missing some of the skills that... Social skills. Yeah. Yeah, there's that, and then there's social media that has also played into that, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of their socializing is texting or gaming online with somebody who's remote from them somewhere. Um, they live more in a virtual world than like I did when I was a kid. Yeah, and I think um, I think the the code of behavior online is so different from at least what our mission is of respect and you know like it's it's got to be pretty it's a hard challenge for us to fight that because you look at comments on TikTok or on Instagram and people are ruthless on these apps and i think you know if you look at that all day you kind of soak in 
it's okay to talk to someone like this or it's okay to say something like that. And in reality, in you know, face to face with someone, it's really not. Right. You wouldn't do that if you're looking somebody in their eye, right? It's harder to kill somebody if you're looking them in their eye. It's easier to press some bo- button, you know, you're, you're, you're um, you're uh, using a drone to kill somebody a thousand miles away. It's a lot easier. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're sitting in your living room and you're conducting war. Mm-hmm. Well, in a way, social media can be like that too, right? You can just lob these awful things at other people, which yeah. is why, I mean, a lot of people are really anxious and are really unhappy and really isolated. Shy, and lonely. reserved. Yeah, they're, you know, it's nasty out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. It's interesting. I have a friend who uh, kind of got pretty popular on uh, this kind of social media platform. And I've always known him, you know, in kind of the character that he put. He's just himself, but he's gotten popular because of that. He's like a sports commentator kind of guy. Right. And I was reading some of the comments on a video that he posted. I was like, geez, like it's so easy just to say things about strangers that, you know, you would never say if you had a face-to-face hour-long conversation you really knew the person and it's it's just a different world again on on right. virtual it's it takes so it takes cyber bullying to the next level i think mm-hmm. right right and that's part of the polarization of our whole society right um we don't know each other really as well um you know we define people by such simplistic things like you're a republican you're a democrat and you must be the evil there for. Mm-hmm. I remember my, um, I don't know why this comes to mind, but my grandparents are Irish. They were born in Ireland and they were um, Northern Irish, so they were Protestants and they emigrate to the, to the US back in like the 1920s, living in New York um, and they buy a house in the, in the Bronx and it's like a, it's a duplex. So there's, there's a whole house on the first floor and then there's like a second floor. So they're renting out the second floor and they rent it out to this woman named Miss, Mrs. Flynn. Sounds like an Irish name, it's an Irish name. And they know Mrs. Flynn and they've come to love Mrs. Flynn. And then one day they find out Mrs. Flynn is Catholic. Mm. And they're Protestants. They had never met a Catholic before in their life. Mm-hmm. For them, Catholics had horns coming out of their head. Right. right. They're evil people, right? Yeah. Just like that, the idea that you don't really know, if you don't know anybody of, of, of a certain class or group or whatever you can really demonize them and dehumanize them so easily yeah yeah for sure so are you from new york yeah you grew up there yeah long island oh long island we're in long island hicksville this um town out on long island it's right smack in the middle of nassau county Mm -hmm. so about 15 miles from the queen's border Mm -hmm. my dad commuted into wall street every day on the long island railroad oh wow yeah so he had a long commute it's like an hour and a half door to door that's to, tough. To Wall Street. Yeah. So he was like kind of not a lot around a lot when I was a kid. Like, you know, he was on weekends. Long hours. Yeah, it was long hours. So he'd leave in the morning before I would even, you know, go to school. And we would ha- go ahead and have dinner without him. He'd come, he'd come home around like 730 or something at night. Mm-hmm. My mom would have like a little sandwich ready for him to have for dinner. <laughs> but anyway, he was working in, uh, for Chase Manhattan and they had like the executive dining room. So he would have this big lunch. And even back then, they it was like, you know, the, the madman era. Right, right. They'd have martinis at lunch and things like that. So he just yeah. got a little sandwich for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you have siblings growing up? I have an older brother and sister, yeah. My brother now is um, living in northern Wisconsin, and my sister lives in Vermont. Oh, wow. So we're separated. But hmm. I'm pretty close to both of them. Northern Wisconsin, interesting. Yeah, it's out in the middle of nowhere. He and my father didn't get along really well. My dad was really conservative. My brother was, you know, he graduated from high school in 68, and he was like Oppenheimer, pretty liberal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Probably would have hung out with commies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so they didn't see eye to eye a lot. Um, my brother's great. I love my brother. He's so smart. I always remember there's like stacks of books in his room and plants. He loved plants. You know, he had all these different plants. Interesting. Um, yeah. All sorts of plants. See a science. He ended up, he well. ended up being a, a botanist. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So how did you get into science? Like, what was the first experience where you kind of were sparked? I guess in an interested, fascinated way. I went to Gettysburg College, and it was there. Um, I, I was an economics major freshman year. 
but I was taking biology and I mean, I've always kind of liked biology, um, but that biology course doesn't like really lit my fire hmm. and economics course really kind of didn't. Econ, yeah, it never really got me going either. I mean, it's got interesting ideas in it, but I really think it was like the professor. He just wasn't. It could be really dry if you don't have someone making yeah. it exciting. It wasn't dynamic and um, the biology was. Yeah. You know, it was just very dark. I because mean, of the labs or? The labs, like, you know, we would, I was like from taking uh, an invertebrate biology course, for example. And let's say we were, we were, um, we were looking at different types of worms. Um, so you'd have live specimens there. And, you know, one type of worm is uh, a segmented worm, a leech. We had, we had finger bowls and it had a leech in it and I'm taking my notes and we're doing this and the leech is like reaching out and it like, well, when I wasn't looking and leeching, reaching out and like attached to me. Oh. Like, so it's so real, like it's yeah. just so right there. It's in your face. Yeah, we went on great field trips and things too, so. Hmm. I really liked biology. Um, yeah, Gettysburg is a great place. I've been there, I think once, but I think we have some seniors headed there next year. Adam Hicks, do you know him? Oh yeah. He's yep. playing baseball there. Yeah. Um, cool. So how'd you get to Gilman? What was the, what's the story of Balt? you know, from New York, from Long Island, go to Gettysburg, I guess Gettysburg's somewhat close to Baltimore. Yeah. But. Yeah. So a lot of my friends from college, I mean, Gettysburg was small. I was less than 2000 students when I went there. My high school had over 3000 students. So when I went to Gettysburg, it was like a huge shift and I was like, oh, I love it here. It's like green, you know, mm -hmm. and bucolic. And yeah. There were a lot of fraternities. It was very old timey, and I, I it really appealed to me. It's like some novel I had read, like a separate piece or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> I had a real, it was very romantic for me. I loved it there, um, and I made a lot of great friends. Um, and they ended up, you know, a lot of them ended up in the D.C. area. Um, nobody actually ended up in Baltimore, um, but when a job came up here, you know, it was not far from you know Long Island, and you know. So, did you know you wanted to teach after? So after college, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, so my sister was living in Vermont. She's a physical therapist. She's working at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. I really didn't want to go back and be at home. I don't know how these kids in their twenties can live at home with their parents. I'm mm -hmm. like, there's no way. Um, yeah. So she's like, come up here, live with me. You can get a job at the hospital. So that's what I did. I spent like a little over a year up there working in the hospital. In Hanover? Yeah, the hospital then was in Hanover. Um, it has, they have since decamped. The hospital has moved to Lebanon, New Hampshire. So um, Hanover is right on the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. And that's New Hampshire. The other side of the river is Vermont. So I actually lived in Vermont, just commuted across the river. I had never been to Dartmouth until this past summer. I'm doing a, a grad program up at Middlebury, mm -hmm. and I went to Hanover for the day, and it's beautiful, I mean, especially in the summer. It's so gorgeous up there. I just love it up there. Yeah. I'm, really pretty. I'm itching to get back to Middlebury. Uh, I'm doing this bread loaf program for yeah. six weeks in the summer. It's like summer camp. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's great. It's, Vermont in the summer is just an awesome state. And the state is so progressive. And there's like 200,000 people in the whole state. Yeah. So yeah. it's great for biking or hiking or, you know, kayaking in the river or d doing just about anything. And in the winter, of course, skiing. The winters were long and cold. It was so cold. I couldn't believe how cold I could get up there when I was living there. Just yeah. awesome cold, though. Did that, Was that bothersome to you? No. It was like I remember being like coming home late one night and um, from a party. I probably had, had a few drinks. Um, <laughs> and I get out of the car. And it's there's not the sky is so clear and this and since it's so cold there's no moisture in the air at all mm -hmm. so the stars were just like so crystal clear and sparkly and there were so many of them I just ended up just looking at the sky even though it was like four degrees out and just like not wanting to go inside because it was just so awesome yeah it's just so awesome stars in Vermont are yeah. amazing so I, I assume at Gilman you've done some um, trips like you've gone to some different places um, what are some of the I guess trips that you've taken as a faculty member here yeah so one of the great things about Gilman are these summer grants oh they're they're the best <laughs> so in, in in early days it was like you, you, it was easier in a way to get them I think than it is now you had like very few hoops to jump through um, so one of my first trips was I wrote a grant to go to France um, I don't even remember what the pretext was and how I connected it to science. 
Um, you can probably connect anything to science. You probably go anywhere in the world that you'd like. I guess you could. I remember, uh, anyway, so I went to France that first time and spent a whole month um, wandering around France, and it was really awesome. Paris or? So I flew in at Paris, spent you know some time in Paris, and then um, I went with another, another teacher friend, Doug Lewis, who taught math here way back in the day. Um, he ended up at uh, Rhode Island at, what's the school up in Rhode Island? A prep school up in Rhode Island? St. George's? St. George's. He ended yeah. up at St. George's, but he taught here for um, eight years or so at least. Anyway, so he and I did this kind of backpacking oh, thing. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so Paris, and like we had like no money, but we could, you could stay, got a hotel room in Paris for like $40, um, you know, for the two of us. Um, and then we went to the Normandy coast. I really wanted to see the Normandy coast. What was that like? I love history, and I wanted to see that coast and all that. And so we obviously we didn't have a car. We're just getting around by train. So I couldn't get right to the coast. So I had a they, you could rent bikes at the train stations. So um, I just like they were crappy little bikes, but whatever. I'm getting on. I need some wheels, you know, after being on you know, trains and backpacks and walking everywhere. I need wheels. So I, I rented a bike and I biked all the way to the Normandy coast. It was incredible. Of course, it was kind of an overcast day. So it was really atmospheric, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this mist. And just seeing those cemeteries, those military cemeteries with the ocean out there and realize like, you know, thinking about what occurred there and you know, that was one of America's finer moments. You know, maybe dropping the bomb was not one of our finer moments, but what we did for Europe and fighting off the Nazis was definitely one of our finer moments. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It was awesome. Hmm. And then from there, we went to Brittany. Oh, yeah, I've heard Brittany's amazing. Yeah, it was really cool, too. And then... Doug had to go back, and another friend of mine from California met me for the last half of my trip, and we did the Loire Valley. And again, we, I was really hooked on this bicycle thing. So we, we were, on, we would bike from Loire, to, in, I mean, from a chateau to chateau. It was really cool to approach these chateaux on a bike. It wow. was, it was really cool. Wow, that sounds like a great trip. So you're a biker, you're a runner as well. Yeah, like outdoors. I love being outside. Hmm. Love being outside. I was talking to Rob Hubeck. He was on the podcast yesterday. And I think the one thing about Baltimore that uh, could improve for me is a little bit more outdoorsy of a scene. Yeah. I mean, I like running. I like biking. But it'd be nice to go on some hikes. And Yeah, I wish we could do some more serious hiking here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... I mean, if you're willing to drive a little bit, though, you can go to Western Maryland. And there yeah. are places to go. Yeah, w West Virginia too. West Virginia, Done some right? Hikes there. Right. So one of the things in retirement I can do is, you know, get go away for three or four day weekends and do more of those things. There's a lot of stuff in this area if you have a little more time. Mm -hmm. I feel so, like I feel like when you you know when we're teaching, although you have the summer off, you almost don't even have a whole weekend off most times. There's always stuff to do to get ready for the next week and there's grading to do and you know, you don't have the freedom to just like have some time. Yeah, Sundays I always say are work days, you know, getting ready for the week, lesson planning, getting some right. grading done. Right, totally. You have to definitely devote a number of hours on your weekend to doing things mm -hmm. or you just can't get it all done in a week. I think one thing that's really true about teaching um, and probably for students is the summer is absolutely necessary. Like this point in the year, I, I feel like we need the summer. You know, <laughs> it's been a, it's been a pretty long year and it's been going and there's a ton going on that summer comes right at the right time and having two and a half months off is just amazing. Yeah, everybody falls into summer totally exhausted. That's true. And, you know, people have been asking me, are you counting the days? Are you count the days? And like, you know, a month ago, no, I'm not really counting the days. They're slipping away so fast as it is. And at this point, I'm like, yeah, I'm counting the days. Everybody's counting the days. If you're a teacher, you're counting the days at this time of year. <laughs> um, what are you looking forward to, I guess, the most in retirement? What's what's appeals to you the most? Are you going to do some traveling? Are you going to stay in this area? What do you think? Well, we're staying in the area, keeping my house. I love my house. So um, be able to enjoy just having a little more time to do the things I like to do, um, whether it's reading or whether it's going away for longer weekends, um, being able to travel at other times of year other than summer. Like, you know, for example, I just heard like, you know, 
travel this summer is supposedly crazy. Like there's more bookings on airlines this summer than there have been since before, well before the pandemic. Hmm. And you know, flights are always more expensive in this summer. So like going to Europe, I can go in the fall when the, it's not as crowded, um, mm -hmm. it's cheaper. I can take advantage of that um, and have more time to see like my brother and my sister who don't live in this state and I can do things with them and spend time in Vermont. Or... Are you a skier at all? Do you ski? Um, I do. I haven't downhill skied in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I got more into cross country skiing just because it was just less fuss and muss, right? You could yeah. just be out there. I like being out in, in, in nature. It's just calming and grounding and, and beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and you just, it's not as expensive. It's just not, you don't have to wait on a line. I just strap on those skis and you can go and yeah. be out there. Yeah, that sounds nice. I've actually never been skiing before, so that's on my bucket list. Oh, yeah. Well, it's not, People it, love it, though. It, there's nothing more thrilling than downhill skiing, skiing, though, you know. Yeah. Just flying down that slope, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. Hmm. Um, is there anywhere, I guess, in Europe or in, in the world that you really want to travel to that you've never been there before or, or somewhere that you want to go back to? So... Um, I've been to Croatia. I've been to Italy a number of times. I've been to France. Um, I've been to Ecuador, Peru, um, Germany. Um, where I haven't been yet is Spain. So I, that's kind of my next international trip. Nice. Would be to go to Spain. Yeah. yeah, Madrid seems interesting to me. I went to yeah. Barcelona this past summer, and to be honest, I, I, I don't know if I'd recommend Barcelona. I did not like it. Well, it's become too much of a tourist it's crazy, Sight, right? It's like New York City and L.A. I've never been to L.A. either, but just so many people, graffiti everywhere. Really? I was overwhelmed. Yeah, too much. What time? That was in the summer? It was in the summer. It was hot. Yeah, see, Spain's not a place to go in the summer. I hear it gets really hot. You, I don't remember. Do you remember Alvaro Salcedo? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's from Madrid. So he's like, yeah, don't go there in the summer ourselves. So, Spain will be a good time to go in the fall. How's he doing? Do you check in with him at all? Yeah, I hear a little bit about him. He's, you know, he's in Ann, Ann, Ann Arbor. Oh, yeah. Michigan, yeah. Is he, is he at Michigan? Is he at U University of Michigan? No, he's working in some, uh, you know, high school. I don't, I don't know the name of the school. Hmm. So his wife got a job out there, and her family's from out there. That's why they went back to Michigan. Cool. Well, I've heard Ann, Ann Arbor is really nice. It's supposed place. to be a beautiful town, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think you're going to, I guess, you know, we're ready to move on, move into the summer, move into retirement a little bit, but what do you think you're going to miss about Gilman? Well, you know, what's the one thing you always miss about a place is not the place so much as the people that you've worked with. And I'll really miss, I think the thing I'm really going to miss the most, which my students will find this hard to believe, is like just the enthusiasm of teenage boy energy um, mm -hmm. and their optimism, um, just all that great energy um, yeah. that they have that can be so exasperating and annoying sometimes, but also just so invigorating. Um, it just, I, I feel like it gives me energy. Um, yeah. It keeps you young somehow, just being around that youthful energy. So I will miss that hugely i think you're right i think sometimes when you get annoyed or stressed out about something and you just step back and think about how how oh, so many of these guys are hilarious yeah, I mean, you just don't take them too seriously <laughs> yeah. you know that's the key yeah you definitely have to be able to step back like that is funny if i was them <laughs> i would find that really funny too but <laughs> But I'm up here, and I got to keep control of this craziness. Um, so they can, it could can be a lot of work sometimes, but mm -hmm. I will definitely miss that. Yeah. Um, how do you think Gilman has changed since you've been here? Like, do you feel like it's changed in pretty noticeable ways over your time, in better ways, and ways that you know, kind of, we've gotten away from certain things? Like, I'm curious to hear about maybe the trajectory of the school since you've been here? I think the main way it's changed is it's gotten bigger. Yeah. Um, I mean, back in 1984, which would have been my first graduation year, um, we graduated less than 100 kids. Now we're graduating 120 kids, so that, you know, multiply that by four, the upper school is that much bigger. 
student-wise. Um, there's more administrators now than there used to be. The whole place is bigger <laughs> that way, um, which means that it's harder to feel like you know everyone. Yeah. Um, so that that's one way. But that's been a subtle change going on, going on, going on over the years. Um, not a dramatic change. I mean... I think, you know, kids are kids, and there's so many things about being a, a kid, a teenager, that hasn't changed at all. But like all these things we've talked about earlier, social media, all those effects, kids today really are a lot different than kids were when I first started teaching here. They are. There's no social media back then. There were no computers. I mean, teachers, we didn't even have computers. Do you think that kids have changed, though? I think it, it's changed the way, yeah, I think it's changed the way we think. Um, you know, there's been a lot written and talked about that, you know, the tension spans and, you know, people didn't walk around like looking at a little teeny screen all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, you know, just texting with somebody who was across the table. Um, so that has changed. Yeah. It's interesting. If you walk around like a study hall or even lunch, everybody's playing chess on their computer or playing a game or on yeah. TikTok. Yeah, yeah. And not that that's not ne ne necessarily negative. It's just different. Um, but that's, you know, you walk through New York City, for instance. You walk through downtown Baltimore. You get on a public transportation, and it's the s same thing. I yeah. mean, yeah, the not, world is that. Yeah, yeah. Gilman's not, you know, we're not separate from the world. What happens out there, you know, comes in here, too. We can't wall all that off. As mm -hmm. much as we try, in a way, to be this little bubble of, mm -hmm. I don't know, old timeness, prep school old timeness. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in a way, we the buildings and everything look like that. Well, everything's prettier now. Everything's more fluffed now. Yeah, the campus didn't look quite as polished back then as it does now. Mm -hmm. I mean, even my alma mater, like Gettysburg College, you know, it's full of these old buildings. There was this one building, Gladfelter Hall, where I had my economics classes, and it was this building built in 1888, and it was kind of that Romanesque kind of architecture, heavy brown stone and brick, and the thing was kind of covered in this layer of kind of soot and ivy, and it was really imposing. I went back there a number of years ago, and I'm like, it's all cleaned up. It looks like it was built yesterday. It's mm -hmm. the same building, but it's just so polished looking. Um, yeah. yeah, our campus is beautiful. I mean, walking around, it's interesting hearing, I think one of the stories about Reddy Finney, about how he was always picking up trash is so fascinating because now like I, I walk around and I'd love to pick up some trash, but there's really not much. <laughs> I mean, we, keep, we keep the place very... Uh, very clean. Now, do you think it's because the kids are picking up after themselves? <laughs> <laughs> or is it an army of caregivers that do it for it, them? It's the army of caregivers. I mean, they're amazing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, it's nice living on campus because, you know, someone's cutting my lawn. Like, I need to get out there and plant a garden. And I've been meaning to do that all spring, but it's amazing how. You know, people really take care of this property yeah, here. Yeah. It's a beautiful campus. It's been great coming here every day for 40 years. You know, I have a little commute. It's a three miles. I get to commute up through Roland Park and come here. Like, I have a great life. I live in this fabulous little bubble. Yeah, it really is a bubble, right? Right? It is a bubble. Um, but everybody lives in a bubble of one sort or another. So mm -hmm. it's good to be in a nice bubble. Let me ask you, do you, um, kind of looking back over your career, do you have a favorite year? Do you have a year that really jumps out at you? <laughs> like you had great chemistry in your class is, and you just felt like, you know, it was one of the most memorable times. I'm not good at remembering years. Um, maybe because I've been here for so many years. It's like, there, you don't have these like hallmarks. Well, I, you know, I remember the year I moved here. Um, remember the year I graduated from college, but um, there have definitely been years where, you know, the group of students you have are just seem a little bit more super special than other years. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, um, you know, in recent history, the, the group of kids I had in chemistry last year um, were really amazing. I really had a great time with them last year, mm -hmm. uh, last year's group. Sometimes you just kind of get lucky with the group. I think that really, especially in a class like English, I can't speak for sciences, but it's really all about the bonding that yes. happens in the classroom and 
the students who know each other coming in and having maybe one or two not class clowns but people who are pretty humorous mm -hmm. can just make it so much looser and more carefree and lively yeah it's kind of like cooking you need just the right mix of things not too much of something spicy or too much sweet you want this like kind of just this right balance mm -hmm. um yeah i think that's really true so you know you want what would makes a class really special i think is um how well they work with each other what you know they're kind to each other they help each other they have a sense of humor, but they're also still able to know when it's time to work and when it's okay to kick back mm -hmm. and, and have that be, uh, respect for that balance. Mm -hmm. That just makes a really special class when that happens. Yeah, yeah, that's really maturity, you know? It's like knowing when to joke around and have fun at the beginning and then, okay, now we've gotta get right. down to it. Right, there's a time to be serious, there's a time to not be serious. Mm -hmm. And, and knowing when that is, is is a maturity issue, I guess you're right, yeah. Do you remember the first time you came to Gilman, like, you know, meeting, I don't know, was, who was the head of school when you came in? Uh, the head of the upper school was a guy named Mercer Neal, who ended up um, being the head of Boys Latin. Um, he left here, and then I think he went south for a while, and then he came back to Baltimore and was the head of Boys Latin before he retired. Um, he was the guy that hired me. Well, Mr. Finney was the headmaster, um, mm -hmm. so I guess technically he hired me. I still remember the first time I saw the school. I approached it from um, Charles Street, Northern Parkway, came at it this way, and like that's when I first started, like, you know, Carry Hall, and they didn't even call it Carry Hall back then. Hmm. I don't think it had a name. Really? No, it is. I don't know what Just we called it. The main building. The main building. The lobby. The main building is what they called it. And then it got kind of christened Carry Hall after the, I guess, the anniversary, the 100th year anniversary. Was the dining hall in the library? No. That, that was, was way before my time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, the back, you know, the back part of the library, the um, east facing windows. All those windows were not there. There was a whole nother building attached onto that. Mm -hmm. And when they did that renovation, if you could call it a renovation, when they added that addition, it was probably in the 60s or 70s. It was a very bad architecture. Um, and they luckily, they saved those big, beautiful leaded glass windows. They stored those somewhere so that when they renovated Carry Hall, they could put it all back together again mm -hmm. when they built the Lumen Center. Um, anyway, so that building attached onto that, and that was like the modern language building, and the dining hall was in there. So they had a dining hall, but it was really small, and um, the school did not provide lunch. They had like, you know, they would sell french fries and pizza and had soda machines. Oh, really? Yeah, they had terrible food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could like buy a ha hamburger or french fries or stuff like that. Most, a lot of kids brought their lunch. So when I came to Gilman five years ago, it was, uh, I think, 70-minute classes, and then we had that bump period after lunch. Yeah. Now we have 80-minute periods, so we're pretty much done school by 12.40, and then yeah. lunch, and yeah. then assembly and afternoon blocks. What was the schedule like when you came in? Do you remember? Was it uh, similar? Yeah, we, we, no. When I first came here, we had eight periods. Jeez. Yeah, and they ranged in length um, from, like, the shortest, I think, was 42 minutes, but they were all like 40-ish minutes. And we had like four minutes or five minutes, depending, between classes. There were bells ringing all the time. A bell at the beginning, 42 minutes later, another bell. Five minutes after that, another bell, the start of the next class. It was like you were constantly jumping and running around from one class to another. And for a science teacher, it was really problematic because if you're going to have a demonstration or something like that, you need to be able to set it up. So I forget exactly how many academic classes we had, and then a, a couple of those periods at the end of the day were for like labs and music and stuff like that. Mm. Um, yeah, interesting. So it was a very chopped up day. That was a really terrible schedule. What about the tri-school students? Uh, we coordinated, but there was less coordination. There was way fewer periods that were coordinated. Okay. So way less coordination. So because the 20 minute walk passing period makes sense because it does take probably yeah. 15 minutes to get the Bryn Mawr. It does. So I guess back then we were only coordinated for like maybe one or two periods. Mm -hmm. 
there weren't as many courses that were coordinated. We couldn't do what we're doing today on that schedule. Was um, were some of the traditions? Do you feel like you know, like assembly, for instance, has that always been kind of the same <laughs> and advisory and pretty much? Yeah, we always had this assembly, is what it was called. It wasn't called community time. Um, was it called chapel? It was, it was actually that before. It was called chapel for a while, but that was. I mean, actually, there still were these hymn boxes attached to the back of the seats with hymns in it. And every once in a blue moon, we'd actually sing a hymn. Can you imagine? <laughs> First of all, the upper school is sitting in there. Your knees always were banging against those little boxes coming off the back of the chairs, which was annoying. And, you know, teenage boys just love to sing hymns. Um, I, think that, I think that actually might be a good addition. Putting like, the hymns back? Yeah, because... <laughs> They come from lunch, they're tired, and they're sitting there. I think having to stand up and sing a song like halfway through would yeah. you know, bring some liveliness sometimes. Well, that's a good point, but maybe not a hymn. Maybe a song. Maybe a song, yeah, like a, like a big glee club kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Like a fight song or something, like, you know, some, something to get everyone up out of their chairs right. for three minutes and then back down. Right. And the other thing, we would have always had a chaplain. Um, and this guy, Chris, I think his last name was, was like Leg or Lath. I can't, it's terrible. I can't remember. Um, he was awesome. He gave really, really interesting talks. Um, so he was, you know, he was an art. He was our employee. So he was, you know, he always gave the talk when there was a talk like that. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just awesome. So I kind of missed that aspect. It was really intellectually and spiritually um, invigorating to hear him talk on the issues he would address. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, I think our community time was a little bit more serious than it is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, DeWeese is onto something, and I'm sure this has happened over the years, but having that assembly on the Grateful Dead the other day about something that he's really passionate about and interested in, I think that's important to see some different sides of your teachers that maybe don't come out in the classroom and stuff that they're really into outside of school. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, so that that would has always gone on too, like teachers would do an assembly about a trip they took or something like that, mm -hmm. yeah. How about advisory? Advisory is pretty much the same as it always has been. Do you feel like uh, there's something about the way that you manage your advisory that you've learned over the, over the years? Because no. I've been trying different <laughs> things, and I think just the relaxed conversational atmosphere is just the way to go because that's necessary. Yeah, they've had their days are structured enough. That I mean, that's one way in which these kids are different than years ago too. Their days are way more structured. Um, everything's structured for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they really like advisories not being yet another structured, we have to get this accomplished kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I don't know, like playing a little game or taking a little quiz or I don't know. Getting to know each other in yeah, some getting way. To know, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Ask them how their day is going. Have you know upperclassmen give underclassmen advice about a class or a teacher or something like that. I think that's. You know what I think? I think it good. might be worth it to have advisory. I mean, I don't think we're going to change the schedule at all, but to have advisory every day, maybe in the morning, like a homeroom, like a homeroom would be nice because, a, I think it's important to check in with our groups, you know, before the day starts to see how everything is going, at least. That way, some teacher has an eye on everybody before they go off to their classes, so we kind of know what their vibe is for the day. Right, and then if you need to talk to a particular advisor about an issue, you've got them right there. You can grab them because sometimes you're like, I really need to talk to this kid, but I don't know where he is or find him. And, and advisory is not happening this week, right. and then you forget. And Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but... It's interesting that we're talking about it today and changing things up maybe. I think there were a lot of good ideas written down on those big pieces of paper in the, today. Um, so there's some good ideas out there and I think it's worthwhile to you know collect it all up and yeah, yeah. do something with it. I agree. Um, Jim, anything else that we can cover today on this, I guess, farewell podcast? <laughs> We've talked about a lot, Oppenheimer, science building, school, 
technology. Anything else on your mind? Not really. I'm going to miss Gilman. Thank you, Gilman, for a great 40 years. It's been wonderful working with everyone here. Um, I've learned so much as a teacher. You just, just, they always say this, the only way to really know something is to teach it, and mm -hmm. that is really true. I mean, I'm still gaining greater insight into my subject matter every time I teach it. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's something that's so cool about teaching is it just keeps you stimulated yes. mentally all the time. Right, so I have to find a way to kind of keep that happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jim, thank you so much, and we're going to miss you here. And um, thank you so much for coming in today and talking a little bit. Hopefully you get a lot of people watching this because I know you've impacted so many people in the Gilman community. So appreciate thank, it. Thanks for saying that, Jake. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.